Thanks, everyone. It's been a great day. Um, very much pleased to be a part of uh, this conference. So here we go. Uh, just quickly, uh, there's a little bit of a change in the title. I've changed uh, Empire to Imperialism. Um, yeah, so I'll start now. <laughs> in the August 12th, 1899 edition of the Saturday, Saturday Review of Politics, Literature, Science, and Arts, British writer Arthur Simons has an essay titled Moorish Secrets in Spain, in which he details the remains, his word, of the Moors in Seville's architectural landscape, and in his words, the persistent followings of their cool, secluded way of building, unquote. With this idea, the persistent followings of the Moors in architecture, Simon suggests that the Moors of the distant past intended to perpetuate themselves in future generations of the region's people via their, and he lists, their mosques, palaces, towers, and gateways. Simons considered such perpetuations to be what he called secrets of the Moors. Of this secret in Moorish architecture, Simons explains, you can see at one glance the conflict or the contrast of two religions, of two theories of the universe. He thus contrasts the abstract beauty of mosques and God's immateriality in Islam from the Christian Bible's materialization in stone in the Gothic church and God's iconographic pers personifications therein. But he not only sees so-called Moorish secrets materially in architecture, he, he also hears them in music. Quote, you cannot walk through a little town in the south of Spain without hearing a strange sound between crying and chanting. The Malagueña, they call this kind of singing. But it has no more to do with Malaga than the mosque at Cordova has to do with the soil on which it stands." Close quote. Such claims to discovering material and sonic survivals of the past in cityscapes and people of the present were certainly not unique to this genre of realist travel writing. It resonates with the work contemporaneous folklorists were conducting in the Americas as well as in Europe at the time. For this reason, Simons' essay is a productive entry point into the study of Malagueñas, specifically its discursive trappings in ori Orientalist discourse of the late 19th century. As Anagil Bardahi shows, 19th century Spanish Arabists contributed significantly to the discourse of Orientalism by virtue of producing un orientalismo español en el sentido saidiano del término, a Spanish Orientalism that Bardahi argues is a domestic orient, situated in a western space, occupying a place that is near or almost coeval, casi intimo en la conciencia española. Besides the absence of Spanish Orientalist writing, Edward Said's Orientalism also leaves unexamined American Orientalist reception before World War II. Indeed, the American reading public throughout the country had opportunities to read Simons' Moorish Secrets in Spain, since editors of the Los Angeles Herald, Daily Morning Journal and Courier, the Evening Star, Kansas City Journal, National Tribune, and Philadelphia Inquirer reprinted excerpts of the essay in the months following its publication in London's The Saturday Review. In this paper, I focus on American realist writer George Parson Lanthrop's 1883 travel book, Spanish Vistas, which he originally wrote as a series of five long essays published in Harper's New Monthly Magazine from April through September 1882. Much of how Lathrop and his contemporary American and British journalists and travel writers perceived Spanish culture and people is consistent with how American historian William Hickling Prescott portrayed Spanish history in his work. As Richard Kagan argues, Prescott's portrayal of Spain in his books of the 1830s through the 1850s helped forge a paradigm for later American historians to perceive Spain as the United States' historical, political, and, and economic antithesis. What the writings of Lathrop, Simons, and other American and British realists occasionally offered their American readers, and what the Prescott paradigm did not, were modes of disciplining readers' listening for not merely Spanish alterity, 
but most immediately the proper regimentation of vocality itself. For instance, Lathrop in the preface to Spanish Vistas explains, the Spanish language with its Arabic gutturals in interspersed among melodious lingual and vowel sounds has been called the masculine development of that southern speech of which the Italian presents the feminine side, close quote. I, I consider such instances of the aural disciplining of American readers toward the racially unimmunized space, uh, sorry, unimmunized Spanish language, reference Arabic gutturals, as consistent with Simons's aural placement of the Malagueña, somewhat between crying and chanting, which encompasses, I argue, audile techniques of Anglo-American imperialism. These audile techniques had been put into practice in rationalizing the United States' varying engagements with Mexico earlier in the century, uh, deployed as they were most readily in confronting the Fandango in Mexico's far northern frontier, and by the 1850s, Napoleon III's intervention in Mexico under his rationale as protector of the so-called Latin race. <clears throat> Whereas the term Malagueña did not appear in print in the United States until the late 1870s, the oral disciplining in which it was cast by writers was imminently rooted in the United States' own conflicted history of rationalizing its imperialist expansion, first westward and eventually into the Caribbean and the Pacific, for the sake of a world order that was contingent on Anglo-patriarchal superiority under the guise of republicanism and democracy. George Parsons Lathrop was an early advocate and exponent of American realist literature. In his essay, The Novel and Its Future, published in 1874 in the Atlantic Monthly, Lathrop defined the realist novel as pertaining to the complicated impulses, emotions, and impressions of the everyday. He warned, however, that there was a difference between realism and literalism, the latter of which he attributed to Balzac's writing in conveying everyday life as too matter of fact or too statistical whereas realism aimed to extract full value and true meaning from the everyday. Realism, Lathrop concluded, emerges from an aesthetic balance between idea and fact. It is assisted by fancy and quick pictorial language. Consistent with his realist aesthetic, Lathrop, in his preface to Spanish Vistas, remarks that he does not concern himself with Spanish political or historical matters. Instead, he aims to make, quote, vivid and faithful the essential characteristics of Spain. He does this by including life sketches produced by Charles S. Reinhardt, of which he writes, his sketches frequently tell more than language can convey. We will search for such metalinguistic or affective moments in the writing of Lathrop and others for what these may further convey of American listening practices leading up to and following the start of the Cuban War of Independence in 1895. In his fourth paper of the Spanish Vistas series titled Andalusia and Alhambra, Lathrop describes in rich pictorial language the people of Seville such that their characteristics align with the author's realist aesthetic. So proverbial, Lathrop declares, is the want of veracity, or to put it more genially, the imagination of these southerners. He continues, their imagination will explain also the vogue of their brief, sometimes pathetic, yet never more than half expressed scraps of song, which are sung with so much feeling throughout the kingdom to crude barbaric airs, and loved alike by gentle and simple people. I mean the peternas and malagueñas, close quote. In other passages, his writing seems to collude or in intersect with the scientific authority assumed by his folklorist contemporaries, as in the analogies he draws between the sung texts and music he observed in Seville and Malaga with that of African Americans and Native Americans. For instance, in Seville, he writes, some of these little compositions are roughly humorous and others very grotesque, appearing to foreigners empty and ridiculous. The following one has something of the odd imagery and inconsequence of our Negro improvisations, closed quote after which he transcribes the English translation of a five-line verse. <clears throat> and these images are from Reinhardt. While in a cafe in Malaga, he writes, Lathrop writes, at last the moment for the flamenco arrives. 
The leader begins to beat monot monotonously on the boards, just as our Indians do with their tomahawks, to set the rhythm. The guitars strike into the rising and falling melancholy strain. Two or three women chant a weird song and all clap their hands in a peculiar measure, now louder, now fainter, and with pauses of varying length between the emphatic reports." Close to quote. This last observation appears in Lathrop's essay, Mediterranean Ports and Gardens, which was the fifth and final paper of the series published on September 1st, 1882. In the first section of that essay, Lathrop goes into rich detail of this flamenco performance, beginning with identifying the audience members as, in his words, sailors, peasants, and chulos, seated, seated drinking at small tables with a very occasional well-dressed citizen or two here and there." Unquote. Once the featured flamenco dancer begins her dance, however, Lathrop obsesses on areas of the woman's dancing body. Quote, a light comes into her eyes, she throws her head back, and her face is suffused with an expression of daring. Her face, partially, partially lifted, seems to catch the light of old traditions and to be imbued with the spirit of something belonging to the past, which she is about to revive. And then he continues, her, referencing her arms, her fingers, her face, her waist. Her body, too, is in motion now, only slightly with a kind of vibration. Then again, her feet, her face. Her feet go a little faster. You can hear them tapping the floor as they weave upon it some more complicated measure. Something between a clog dance and a walk, perfect in time, with a complexity in the exercise of the feet demanding much skill." Close quote. After another paragraph of writing that is itself terpsichorean in its syntactical flow, <laughs> and, and you got you to read it, it's actually pretty um, engaging. Problematic nonetheless. Lathrop, Lathrop arrives at an affective moment out of which he devolves into a narrative mode that seems to exceed his own realist aesthetic. He writes, now she almost comes to a standstill, and then we notice a quivering, shaky, snaky, shuddering motion beginning at the shoulders and flowing down through her whole body. Wave upon wave, the dress drawn tighter with one hand showing that this continues downward to her feet. Is she a lamia in the act of undergoing, undergoing metamorphosis, a serpent or a woman? Then all at once the stamping and clapping and the twanging of the guitar strings are stopped as she ceases her formal gyrations. She walks back to her seat like one liberated from a spell and the whole thing is over. As we can see and perhaps hear, this affective moment of the performance, fleeting as it may have been, rendered from Lathrop the discourse of Greek mythology without which this moment might have been left indescribable and for us unrecorded. But there is more to read into this passage than his imagined materialization of the myth mythological monster or child devouring half woman and half serpent. Embodied sounds crucial to the constitution of personhood as defined within a modern republic Republican regime seemed particularly absent at that moment. What Lathrop engages in here, <clears throat> engages in here is a zoo politics of the movements and sounds of this dancer and her accompanying musicians not to render their dancing and sounding as incoherent as much as to situate Lathrop and his American readers in an orality and kinetically bounded space differentiating themselves from that other worldliness of the flamenco which exceeds their own humanity, systems of comportment and presentness in the modern world. In her study of writing and the inscription of the acoustic in colonial and post-colonial Colombia, Colombia, Ana Maria Ochoa Gautier shows that for linguistics and folkloristics, reigning in the nomadism, nomadism of languages spoken throughout the emergent nation, depended most urgently, I'm sorry, reigning in the nomadism of languages spoken throughout the emergent nation, depended most urgently on disciplining the acoustic recognition of different practices of vocalization or sounds of natural entities. Indeed, the Anglo-American imperialist project, like its contemporary Colombian national project, relied on disciplining the listener to traverse the oral boundaries between the human and non-human, nature and culture, this world and those of other universes, the binaries of which Ochoa considers to be 
mutually constituted through the politics of life. Carl Hackstrom Miller pursues a similar study of folklore's role in racially segregating music of the American South, which he traces to the start of the regime of Jim Crow, which coincided with Lathrop's travels through Spain. Thus, I conclude with pertinent excerpts in which Lathrop and others inscribe Malagueño music and singing for their readers in precisely the kind of zoo politics of listening that rendered the sounds of bodies racialized as other or bogas, uh, African Americans and Spanish Roma, as paradigmatic of their status as pathological, animalistic, or simply non-human, of another world, and in need of regimentation. <clears throat> While in Seville, Lathrop wrote, I have seen gypsy singers grow apoplectic with the long breath and volume of sound which they threw into these eccentric melodies amid thunders of applause. It is not a high nor a cultivated order of music, but there lurks in it something consonant with the broad stimulating shine of the sun, the deep red earth, the thick, strange flavored wine of the peninsula." Unquote. And in Granada, while touring around the Alhambra, he wrote, all day there was a loud chorus of cicadas and a rain of white hot light sifting through the leaves. But at night, everything died away except the rush of water, which grew louder and louder, till it filled the whole air like a ghostly warning. I used to wake long after midnight and hear nothing but this chilling whisper, unless by chance some gypsies squatted on the road were singing malagueñas, or the strange piercing note of the tree toad that haunts the hill rank uh, Hill rang out in elfin and inhuman pipings of woe." Unquote. Lathrop inscribes onto the voice of Spanish Roma singers quali qualities that question their personhood. The anger in their voice always exceeds their potential for having a rational voice, a flaw which is as natural to their constitution as the landscape and its products are to Spain, or as the sun is to the earth. Yet they are human enough for Lanthrop to interpret meaning from their voices, a recognition of which he is careful to, quali to qualify in equating the so-called squatting gypsy alongside a road to the tree toad that haunts the hillside. Um, and I think this, this image in particular is interesting, just the way the face is illustrated right, by Reinhardt. Um, and I would like to look further into just how much physiognomy, the science of the, the, of, of racial uh, biology uh, in the 19th century uh, were informing illustrators of, of novels, including Reinhardt. There, because I think there's a lot to say about the way he's depicting uh, the Spanish Roma. <clears throat> Spain, and Andalusia in particular, continued to attract the imaginations of American and British writers and journalists into the 1890s. One article, published in the Washington Post in 1895, is especially notable since it appeared in the same month, February, that Jose Martí declared his Grito de Baire. The author, K.D. Hughes, describes the national dances of Scotland, Ireland, Egypt, Spain, among other nations, and therein delineates the characteristics of the people, or volk, of these nations. Coquetry, passion, frenzy, and compulsiveness are some of the characteristics he attributes to Sevillanos. Of the Malagueña, he writes, the young girl rises and dances a Malagueña while her friends seated on the grass look on smoking cigarettes, Closed quote. He implies soon after that the vigor and stre strength that these women put into such dancing and recreation are not put into more industrious labor. I conclude with one last excerpt in Arthur Simons' Moorish Secrets in Spain, published four years after Hughes's article, when in the interim, the United States had conquered Spain's remaining American colonies and the Philippines. Simons writes, and this Moorish music, referring to Malagueña, avoids definite form. It has the same endlessness, motion without beginning or end, turning upon itself in a kind of infinite, infinitively varied monotony it is like the crying of a wild beast in suffering 
and it thrills one precisely because it seems to be so far from humanity, so inexplicable, so deeply rooted in the animal of which we are but one species. Moorish music is inarticulate, and that's a really important point there, right? About orality and language and the distinction between uh, the human and the non-human, the personhood, citizenship, and so on. Uh, um, Moorish music is in, inarticulate, and so it brings a wild relief which no articulate music could ever bring. It is a music which has not yet lost companionship with the voice of the wind, the voice of the sea, the voices of the forest. It remains chaotic, elemental, a part of nature, trying to speak." Unquote. As a response to the trauma and crisis of national identity that followed 1898, Spanish writers and historians, according to Anahil Bardají, attempted to resituate the place of Andalusians in Spanish history. This work, too, was not without uh, but he notes, it's racist and xenophobic rationale for Hispanicizing its people with the aim of disciplining personhood and citizenship in the wounded empire. Thank you.